We're wrapping up a sermon series today called Opportunity Killers, and it's a little bittersweet. I like, um, I like moving on to something new, but I don't like leaving something old. I think that, I think you could be called a hoarder if that's your problem, right? I like a lot of new things, but I also like all my old things. Um, we're going to talk about forgiveness or, or better yet, unforgiveness in a way that I don't, that I'm pretty confident you may have not have thought about it. And I think this is extremely important in family and in the church. And so we're gonna look at a portion of scripture that is, um, that is not unfamiliar with some of you probably. Uh, others, it may be the first time you've heard it, but this principle of forgiveness and how do we deal with it because I can assure you, if you harbor unforgiveness, you will miss opportunities in your life. Unforgiveness will kill opportunities for you to have peace, for you to have joy, maybe for you to even have a job. If it's bad enough, unforgiveness destroys us. And so this question came up in front of Jesus, and we're gonna, we're gonna look into it in Matthew chapter 18. Uh, but I think I'm going to present it in a way that um, we're going to look into it. And I think if we look into the whole context of the story of Matthew chapter 18, you're going to walk away with maybe a different idea of what forgiveness is. Because after all, in our modern day definition of forgiveness, pretty easy. Like I can forgive you and still block you on Facebook and Instagram and wherever. Like I can forgive you and not invite you anything. I, forg I can forgive you and act like you don't exist. It's like, no, they don't bother me. I forgave them. They don't bother you because you never go around them again. And so like, I can forgive you, but I don't have to like you. I don't know if that's true. But it's become our modern definition of forgiveness. Forgiveness is just, unforgiveness just ties us up. And it does that. But we're going to look at this Matthew chapter 18 in a little bit. We're going to go back a little bit in chapter 17 and take a look. So. Why don't you stand to your feet in honor of the word? We're going to start in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. You can find the Hope Community Church app on your phone. If you haven't downloaded that, go to Apple iTunes or that other thing people use. And you can download uh, the church app. You can also find it on the Bible app as well. Matthew chapter 18, verse, starting at verse 21, say amen if you're ready. Right. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Remember that verse right there because, it, because he's saying something very specific. How often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Some translations say 70 times seven. Can we just agree it's a lot? Verse 24, therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and seizing him, he began to choke him. This is old school mafia stuff here. Seize him and began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. And then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in danger and in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, if we have 
ask you for forgiveness, your word says that you, were, you were, are faithful to forgive us of our sins. So Lord, we pray that we'd be reminded of what you have already done for us and how that should translate into our actions to others. We're thankful for your forgiveness. It was more than we could pay. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. You may be seated. All right, anytime you're reading the word of God and you start out, maybe you started out, let's say you got up this morning and you wanted to read the Bible and you read Matthew chapter 18, you started verse 21, it said, then Peter asked Jesus a question. You should always stop there. Now, if you read, if you read the beginning of Matthew 18 yesterday and you remembered it, then you would have the context for how, the, why, and this question was asked. But if not, it always behooves you to go back then and find out, well, what was before this? If, if it starts out, then Peter, then I want to know what caused Peter to do this. Why, why was he asking the question? Peter's doing this in response to something. So if we go back to the beginning of 18 and actually the end of chapter 17, we find out that at the end of chapter 17, Jesus tells the disciples uh, once again that he's going to die and die at the hands of the chief priests and the elders, the teachers of the law and all that stuff. He's going to be, he's going to suffer and die. And the third day he's going to rise again. The irony is when you get to chapter 18, Jesus had come to Capernaum and was teaching the disciples this. He hasn't left Capernaum. He's still with the disciples. They start asking questions about, well, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? <laughs> Isn't it human nature to say the boss is leaving? Who's going to be the boss? Instead of, wait a second, you said you were going to die and in three days rise again. That's crazy. Could you please explain to us how that's going to happen? Nope, that wasn't the question. The question was, when you're gone, who's going to be the boss? We'd like to know. We know this was a constant discussion they were having because J James and John's mother would go to Peter and say, or go to Jesus and say, hey, when you come into your kingdom, can one of my sons sit on your right and one of mine on your left? And Jesus is like, you don't even know what you're asking for. So we start chapter 18 with them saying, who's going to be the greatest? Come on, who's getting the promotion? We know you're leaving. And Jesus, um, Jesus grabs a kid for an illustration. At the beginning of chapter 18, he grabs a kid and brings a kid in. And, um, and he says, hey, unless you become like one of these little ones, humble yourself like one of these little ones. Unless you can become humble like one of these little ones, you're not going to be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I can imagine Peter going, that's not, that's not actually what we asked, but we'll go with that. Thanks for the little kid illustration. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. So now he's moving from whoever humbles himself to don't you dare cause one of these little kids to sin. Do you see how, do you see how the conversation is kind of progressing? All of a sudden, the little kid's taking over the conversation. He pulls the kid in and he says, he says, unless you humble yourself like one of these little kids, you're not going to be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. And by the way, don't you dare cause one of these kids to sin. And if you do, it would be better for you to tie a big rock around your neck and jump into the ocean. Some of Jesus' teachings were a bit hyperbolic, wouldn't you say? If you're going to cause a kid to sin, man, we should be teaching our society that right now. If you're going to cause a kid to sin, tie a millstone around your neck, jump into the water. Then he transitions from that to telling a story about a lost sheep. Actually, in verse 7, before he gets to the lost sheep, he says, he goes, here's the kid. Be humble like the kid. Don't cause the kid to sin. And by the way, don't you sin either. And if you have, a trouble, if you have trouble with sin, here's the hyperbole again. Gouge your eye out. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. 
Now, we're not a church that does that before communion or anything. We're not, we're not like, hey, we're getting ready to take the Lord's Supper. Um, if, if your eye calls you sin this week, pop it out and we'll deal with that after the church service. This is hyperbolic, okay? He said, if your hand calls you sin, cut it off. It'd be better off to go into heaven without an eye or a hand. He's saying, this is how dramatically you should be dealing with sin in your life. So follow progression. I'm going to die and resurrect. Who's going to be the greatest? To, look, unless you become humble like a kid, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Don't you dare cause one of these kids to sin. By the way, you need to deal with the sin in your own life. And then he transitions to verse 10 of chapter 18. He says, if you got a hundred sheep and one walks off, wouldn't you go get it? Wouldn't you go get it? You, you would go get it. You wouldn't just... You wouldn't just not go get it. And he says, verse 15 then, he goes like this. I'm going to read it to you. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. All right. Now, now follow me. I'm going to die and resurrect. Who's going to be the greatest? Unless you humble yourself like a kid. By the way, don't cause this kid to sin. Deal with the sin in your own life. And, and if, if, if one of these little sheep run away, you would go get it. Remember, so sin, we're dealing with sin and reconciliation. He's painting this picture. And then he, then he says this. If your brother sins against you, you go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one of two... Take one or two others along with you that, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. He's referring to the Old Testament now. If he refuses to listen to them, tell, the, tell it to the church. Now, the church wasn't, didn't quite look like this. So he wasn't saying, go tell it to 600 people on Sunday morning and another couple hundred online and then throughout the week, thousands of people. Don't broadcast. He's not saying broadcast it to the whole church. The churches were smaller little groups of people back then. Don't worry. If I find out something about you, and I have. <laughs> I'll talk to you about that qualification here in a second. And if he refuses to listen, even to the church, let him be as you as a Gentile. So, over the years, this process of Matthew chapter 18 has been used to excommunicate people from the church, but that's not why Jesus was telling it. Remember, right before this, he was talking about don't cause a kid to, a, a kid to sin. Deal with the sin in your own life. And, he, and, and then he said, if, if, a sheep goes, if a sheep runs off, you'll go get it. Then he said, if somebody sins against you, here's a process by which you restore these people. Are you following me? Amen. This wasn't a process just to get people out of your church. Well, I'm glad they're not here anymore, sinner. No, this was a process of restoration. Go out of your way to go to them if they sin against you. All right. So now, everybody clear where we are? Unless you humble yourself like a kid, you're not going to get into the kingdom of heaven. Don't cause this kid to sin. It'd be better off to tie a big rock around your neck and jump into Sleepy Creek. By the way, if there's sin in your life, deal with it drastically. Just get it done. Eliminate it. Don't go there anymore. Don't watch that anymore. Don't be with those people anymore. Unless it's your spouse, then it gets complicated. All the, like, deal with it. Then he says... Listen, if one person, if one sheep would run away, you'd go to reconcile. You'd go to, you would, you would, that would be worth you going after. So if somebody sins against you, I want you to go to them and, and make, and reconcile that person. I want, I want you to go to the extent where you'll take a, like if they don't listen to you, you'll take a, you care about them so much, you'll take a couple people with you. Then we get to verse 21. And now it's going to make all kinds of sense because now Peter says this. Then Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? 
Jesus just painted a picture of what restoration looks like, and it's a process, isn't it? Peter said, that looks tiring. Can we put a number on how many times I got to do this? I mean, I got a full-time job. So in that time, which I tend to agree with, I think it's a great idea to only forgive people three times. Anyone else? I think it's a superb idea. So Peter, knowing that, comes to him and says, Lord, how many times should I forgive someone that sins against me? He didn't say sinned. He said sinned against him. Follow me. How about we go with seven? It's, it's not the three that it was typical. It's four extra. Look at me. Look at me, Lord. Don't you think I could be the greatest in the kingdom? Jesus spins to him and says, Peter, not seven. How about 77 or sometimes 70 times seven? And I can feel the exhaustion coming on Peter. <laughs> you want me to keep doing this? You want me to, you know the friends I have? You know the friends I have? You want me to keep, you want me to keep forgiving people? Now remember the description he just gave of forgiving somebody. The description he gave of forgiving somebody was not just forgive them and block them. The, the description he gave for forgiving somebody was a process of going to that person and trying to restore them in their sin. Oh, that is not a common definition of forgiveness nowadays, is it? So now Peter's having the same response you're having right now. You can't expect me to do this forever. You can't expect me to do this. I mean, how many the same person? You want me to keep going back to him over and over? Jesus said, as many times as it takes. Remember, I just told you about the sheep. If the sheep runs off, it's worth going and getting Remember, you have to take all of Je Jesus is still in that same frame of teaching. And Peter comes to him and says, how many times? Seven? Come on, that's a stretch. That's a real stretch. He says, just keep doing it. And then, like Jesus does all the time, he says, hey, man, I got a story for you. I got a story for you. Let me tell you a story. Um, there, was a, there was a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. He's just bringing people in saying, hey, man, how much do you owe me? Let's get this settled. This guy comes in. He owed him 10,000 talents. Now, let's put that in perspective. One talent for a common servant at that point in time or a laborer was 20 years of labor. One talent. So 10,000 times 20 years of labor. So I, I want you to think about it like this. So essentially, a whole career, some of you have government jobs, you retire in 20 years, right? A whole career working for the government times 10,000. A career times 10,000. So this guy owed the king 10,000 talents, a career times 10,000 is what he owed him. And can, can, did, did, when you read that, do you ever wonder how in the world did he get in that much debt? He's down at the casino just playing the slots going, it's going to be my big day. It's going to be my big day. That's an astronomical amount. That's an amount I don't care generationally, if from that point forward to today, his descendants couldn't pay it back. It was an obscene amount of money. Jesus is telling this story on purpose to show Peter something. So he says, here's this guy. He owed 10,000 talents. No way. He, the absurdity of it, the guy falls on his face. Remember, if, unless you humble yourself like a little kid, you can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. So what does this guy do? He realizes the debt that he owes and he throws himself on his face like a little kid. Then he starts talking like a little kid. He starts saying this, if you give me a chance, I'll pay it back. Come on, haven't your kids done that before? You just broke the car. You're seven. 
you'll never be able to pay this back. What are we talking about here? So he's now threw himself at the mercy of the king and he's saying crazy stuff. No, 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 give me a chance. I'll pay it back, I'll pay it back. Well, the king realizes I can imprison you and your whole family until the savior comes and you're not paying this thing back. So the story goes out of pity. The king forgives him the whole thing. I'm glad that, um, that I serve a God who can have pity on me. Because do you know how many times I've thrown myself at his feet going, I'll make it right. Isn't that our first response sometimes? We throw ourselves down and we say, I'll make it right, Lord, I'll make it right. I'll make it right, I'll make it right. Lord, I won't do it again, I won't do it again. You know you're gonna do it again. I won't do it again, I'll make it right, I'll, I'll earn it off. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. And yet God knows we are incapable of paying it back. There's an old hymn. It, it goes kind of like, um, I, he paid a debt. Do you remember that? He did not. I owed a debt, I could not pay. <laughs> he washed my sins up. It's kind of a bouncy little hymn. Boy, we used to sing that when we were kids. It was a realization that I owed something that I would never be able to pay back. My parents couldn't pay it back. It wasn't a student loan. Hey, it wasn't any of that. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't any of that. It wasn't any of that. It was something that was out of my realm of correcting. And yet God had so much grace and mercy on me. He didn't have to pay it, but out of his great love, he chose to pay it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him, like a little child, would not perish but have everlasting life. So all of a sudden, as Christians, we find ourselves, if we're honest, in a circumstance that we are incapable of affecting. And the God of all the universe has Grace and mercy, call it pity if you want, because every time I go to him, I'm like, I'll make it right, I'll make it right, I'll make it right. And he goes, Chris, you can't. I could imprison your whole family forever and you'd never be able to pay me back. Because here's the irony, all of us owe the same amount. Nobody can work it off for you. So the king has pity on him, forgives him his whole debt. There's a great example in there of how it works between us and God that he, that when we humble ourselves before him, he does forgive us, amen? He is faithful to keep doing that over and over and over again. James talks about it. He says, he says that he is faithful, that he, he says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What do he say? Humble yourself like this little kid. And then in James 4, 10, he says, humble yourselves before the Lord. He will exalt you. Look at your neighbors. Tell them you don't have enough money. You, you're, not that, you're not talented enough. You're not, you don't have enough to pay it back. And then look at them and say, but you're forgiven anyway. You're forgiven anyway. This is a beautiful part of this story, a beautiful part of this story where we can throw ourselves at the mercy of God and he will forgive us. Not maybe, not if, not could you put a little with it, not can I trust you, no, no, no. He will forgive us. Then the story has a twist. It's not a good one. After this servant experiences unimaginable grace and mercy, he stands up and the story Jesus tells sounds like he kind of immediately goes out from there and sees somebody that owes him money. Oh, now it's about ready to get real. Because now we're not talking about what we owe God, now we're talking about what we owe each other. And I'm going to collect now. God can forgive you, that's his prerogative. I need something I can eat. You owe me money, I gotta pay my bills, right? So the guy gets up and he walks out and he um, sees another servant that owes him um, a bit of money. 
And the crazy part about, he just came from being on his face in front of the king going, come on, just give me a shot. I'll pay it back. I'll do the right thing. I'll do the right thing. The guy, for, the king forgives him. He gets up, turns around. He's walked out. That guy, that guy was me. Hey, don't you go anywhere. You owe me. My, walks over to him, doesn't even have a conversation with him. Says he puts his hands around his neck, starts choking him. Some of you might not choke anybody, but you know what I'm talking about. And the guy says, no, 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 no. I'll pay it back. I'll pay it back. He has the exact same response. He says he throws himself down in front of him. I'll pay it back. Just give me a chance. I'll pay it back. Now, here's the irony about the whole thing. I'm going to read to you from a commentary that I use. It says, the amount owed him is not insignificant, though worth but a few dollars in terms of metal currency. It represented 100 days wages. Okay. 10,000 times a career is what the guy owed. Now, this guy owns about a third of a year in wages. Which one was more likely to pay it back? A th that's like less than a car loan. Some of you drive nice cars. You ain't paying them off in a third of a year. Amen? Amen. So the amount owed him is not insignificant, though worth but a few dollars in terms of metal currency. It represents 100 days wages for a foot soldier common laborer. Yet the amount is utterly trivial compared with what has already been forgiven him. This, the similarity of this fellow's servant's plea to his own does not move this unforgiving man. He doesn't even realize he's saying the same thing he did right before. He can't even hear it. I'm so frustrated with you because you sinned against me because you owe me money. I'm so frustrated with you that I can't understand. I can't even hear you saying the exact same thing I said to get it forgiven. Now, here's an issue. The same commentary talked about a laborer at that time. So, so this worked differently than what our common knowledge of slavery is today. If I owed you money that I couldn't pay you, I, I would become a servant to end up pay that money back. Now, in Old Testament times, every so many years, those servants would be released. They weren't permanent slaves. So just get that, get that in your mind. It looks different. So what happened, what would happen is there was, there was an average price that a laborer would be worth. So if I came to you and I said, uh, hey, I can't pay you back, I'm gonna have to work it off. Well, there was an average, it's about 500 denarii is what I would be worth to you. But here's the kicker. I couldn't charge more than what you owed me. Can we do a little economic calculation here? We find out that the average laborer is worth about 500 denarii. How much does he owe? 100 denarii. Now, because of unforgiveness, the man has devalued him. Can anybody help me out with the math? Maybe somebody online, send it in a text. 500 minus 100 is what? 400. Look at your neighbor and say, I knew you could do it. I knew you could. I knew you had it in you. 400. Do you see what happened here? Because there was no forgiveness, he devalued the man. Are you following me? You're worth 500, but I can only charge what you owe me, so I'll throw you in prison anyway. I won't even let you work it off. I don't care if it was 50 bucks. You're not getting away with it right now. I don't care what it is. I, I know what they say you're worth, but you owe me. Oh, come on. How often do we do that to other people? I know other people think you're worth it, but you've offended me now. I know other people say you're a good person, but you've sinned against me and nobody sins against me. So now Jesus is painting the picture of this unimaginable forgiveness and this unimaginable unforgiveness in the same story. And then all of a sudden, if you think unforgiveness doesn't impact everybody around you, 
if, you're, if you don't forgive people, people start snitching on you quick. So he throws a guy in prison. All the servants that associated with this guy went, oh, no, 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 we're not gonna let that happen. I know he was forgiven more money than anybody on the planet could pay back. And he had the nerve to throw him in prison. So they go back to the master and tell on him. A couple of whistleblowers went to the master and told on him. The master calls him back in. He says, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I've just forgiven you so much you couldn't ever pay it back. And now, and now this guy owes you a fright, like it's, a, it's measly. And you would have the nerve to throw him into prison. Now watch the statement that the master makes. I'm gonna lock you up now until you pay it back. Mm. You wanna know why hell's eternal? Because you can't pay it back. This is a window into not accepting the forgiveness of God and then not giving it out to anyone else. This is a window. He said, I'm, now you're going to be in prison until you, can, until you can pay it back. Hey, Buster, remember when you were on your hands and knees begging me to, for an opportunity to pay you back? Now you're going to get what you asked for. If you won't accept the grace that I give you and then offer it to other people, now you're going to get to try to earn it back. And guess what? Nobody can. So you're going to get locked up until you, until you pay it back, which is never. All right. You ready? Because this is what this means for us. Watch this. I believe inside the church, inside the body of Christ, inside your family, inside when we, where we have these relationships, that Jesus is spelling out what forgiveness looks like, and it's totally different than what we, than what we have currently thought of up to this point. And here's why. People are going to sin against you. Somebody say amen. Come on, somebody online say amen. If you want to text us in who sinned against you recently, that'll be fine. <laughs> people are going to sin against you. Amen? In the church, people are going to upset you and do things wrong against you. We learned last week we're all sinners. I'm going to offend somebody at some point in time, and I'm not even going to do it. I'm going to do it with a smile on my face. That was fun. Okay. Can I tell you this right now? Because Jesus painted the picture this way, I want to make a declaration over the body of Christ, over the church. There are no victims in the body of Christ. Did you hear that? There are no victims in the body of Christ because we've all been forgiven and we're all in the same boat. We've been forgiven and we have people sin against us. The issue is, is if he described us as victims, we could sit back and be a victim. Oh Lord, look what they did to me. Look, you forgave me and did they hurt my feelings? No, 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 he doesn't call us victims. He says, you've been forgiven. Now when somebody sins against you, you then, That's why, it's, that's why Peter was like, how many times? Are you kidding me? How many times? When somebody sins against you, remember, you're not a victim. Then you get up and you go restore them. Why? Because they're sinning. So all of a sudden, this isn't about what happened to you. This is about restoring them. Oh, that's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? Because we've been taught to only focus on what's happened to us. Look at what happened to me. I don't know if I ever recovered. Look at what happened to me. Look at what they said about me. Look at what they did to me. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? Can you believe it? Can you believe it? And yet Jesus turns around, tells a story and says, no, 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 Peter, you go, forget about what happened to you and you be so concerned about your brother, you wanna restore them from the sin they committed. Which one of you, if you have a hundred sheep and one walks off, wouldn't go run and get it? Remember the whole teaching? Humble yourself. Lord, I'm you've forgiven me so much. It doesn't matter what they owe me. 
it doesn't matter what they owe me. You've forgiven me so much. It doesn't matter what they owe me. So all of a sudden now, now I'm not thinking about what you did to me. I'm thinking about how to restore you. All of a sudden, I'm not offended by what you did to me. All of a sudden, I'm concerned about you. Matthew 18, verse 15, if your brother sins against you, you go to them and restore them. Why? Because I care more about you than what you did to me. I care more, come on, didn't you grow up in brothers and sisters? What if our families treated each other like, what if the church as, what if the big C church, what if we treated each other like this? I know you did that to me. I know I have every right to be upset with you, but I'm more concerned about your relationship with Christ right now than what you did to me. That's what he taught me to do. Listen, I've been forgiven so much, I can't even hold anything up against you. I've been, it's been wiped clean every day since I started following him. And I, it, it, for me to hold this against you would be me sinning. So all I, I want you to be right with God. That's the only reason I'm here. I'm not here. I'm not here to get something from you. I'm here because I want you to be right with God. That's the only thing. So now the table's turned. Now it's not me complaining about them. It's me praying for them. And it's me trying to reconcile with them. And it's me going to them. Wait a second, they did it to me. Yeah, they did it to me. Jesus would play this out with Peter. We've talked about this. Jesus is arrested that, that crazy night at the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter and John are standing around a fire in a courtyard with an eye shot and ear shot of Jesus. And, and, and people started asking Peter, hey, aren't you with him? Aren't you with him? Aren't you with him? And he's like, no, no, I'm not with him. And he, and he says some bad stuff in the middle, no, I'm not with him. And then the prophecy that Jesus told him comes true and he hears a, he hears a rooster crow and it's like, ah, who sinned against who? Jesus didn't do anything. Peter had walked with Jesus for close to three years and now he's acting like he did. I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know him. Jesus, after he resurrected, wasn't walking around going, you believe what Peter did to me. Whole reason I died was because he wouldn't stand up for me at that, at that, at that fire that night. He, he ran from me, I can't believe him. I can't even talk to him again. This Peter, I told him that we were gonna build a church on him. I told him on this rock I'll build my, I'm taking it back. I'm gonna unfriend him on Facebook. I'm not even gonna talk to him anymore. Remember which of you has a hundred sheep that if one runs off, you wouldn't go get him? Peter and the disciples after Jesus' resurrection find themselves fishing again. When they, they're pulling up close to the shore and they've got no fish, who do they see standing on the shore? Jesus does not wait on Peter to find him. He goes and finds Peter. Jesus does not wait. When Peter comes to his senses, he'll come over here and he'll tell me he's sorry and, and he'll make it all right and he'll pay me back and he'll do this and he'll do, no, 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 no. Jesus did not wait. Jesus did Matthew 18, verse 15. Jesus uh, did not wait for Peter to do everything right. Jesus goes to the seashore and says, hey, throw that net out on that side and blesses Peter. Peter comes to the seashore and he forgives him in front of everybody. Hey, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Take care of them, do it, Peter. Come on, you're back, let's go. Jesus went and chased him down, not the opposite way. So Jesus is displaying this for everybody. When somebody sins against you, don't play the victim card. It's going to happen. And it may be somebody close to you. It may be somebody that proclaims Jesus. It may be somebody in the church. When that happens, you are not a victim. You have already been forgiven and made whole. There are no victims in the church. So your response to it is, I care about you enough to chase you down and make the thing right. You can't hurt my feelings anymore. He's forgiven me. So I'm gonna run you down until this is right. This is what forgiveness in scripture looks like. I don't forgive you and then never talk to you again. I forgive you and care about you so much that I'll have the sin conversation with you. I want to see you made right before God. This had nothing to do with me. You can't hurt my feelings. He's forgiven me. I want to see you made right before God. I want to see you humble yourself before God. I want to see God forgive you. That's what this is about. That's why Peter said, Lord, how many times I got to do this? 
How many times do you want me to walk through this process? And Jesus said, keep doing it, Peter. Keep doing it, Peter. Keep doing it. And I'm going to show you how to do it because you're going to blow it one day and I'm going to chase you down. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Stand to your feet this morning. If you can get in your mind that the most important thing about somebody that's sinning is not who they sinned against on this earth, but making sure they're right with the only one who can actually forgive them of that sin. Amen? That's the church's job. We chase people down. Even if they've offended us, we chase them down and make sure they're right before God. So Father, we ask you to do that this morning. All across this room, in Berkeley Springs, online, people that are watching this five years from now, Lord, I pray that you'd speak into them. Lord, the importance of forgiveness and what it looks like and what restoration really looks like in the church. God, make us more. Give us a heart of Christ that we would forgive unconditionally and restore and make new, Lord. Come on, we thank you. Give us the strength and the energy to pull that off by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Come on, can you lift your voice? Come on, tell him you need his forgiveness this morning. You need his power, his energy. Come on, do it, church.